Good morning, theater production class. I miss you all dearly. Um, just trying to make sure we meet our uh, objectives for the course. It would have been much for, more fun to learn them in an online, on an on-ground environment where we can get our hands dirty, learn about painting from painting, but we're doing the best with what we have. Of course, um, I just have to say off the bat that I hope you are doing well. I hope you're taking long walks and taking good care of yourself taking good care of the people in your house, whoever that may be. Um, it is an uncertain time, and um, we as artists are charged with bringing light and love to the world. So um, I'm enjoying reading your uh, answers to the nine uh, questions, the Proust questionnaire. You guys are so much fun. And um, today I'm going to be kind of talking about some careers in theater that were outlined on your syllabus, and some of them are... Um, not really anything that we do in our theater, so we'll take an extra amount of time with that. And I'm using pictures from past plays, so you might see yourself in this little presentation. So uh, I have Backstage Badger there because it is, uh, like any workplace environment, you have what your official job title is, and then when push comes to shove, you do everything, right, um, to make sure that the job gets done. Uh, some of you, when you start out in professional theater, you may be hired as what's called an actor technician. You may spend one day helping hang lights and the next day sitting behind a sewing machine stitching and the next day raking the stage, whatever it may be, um, to get paid. So, uh, And sometimes those jobs are available as internships and then sometimes they're paid gigs. But really, actor technician jobs are great because you get kind of a taste of everything in the theater. Of course, you know from theater production, I never just ask you to act, I also ask you to do something else. Um, because I think it's really important as an actor to understand what everybody in the theater does. And I want you to come out of this being a well-rounded theater artist, a theater generalist, especially since we live in a rural area where specialization just isn't always an option, right? If you're doing community theater, you may be asked to put together your own costume or come up with your own prop. Um, even in professional theaters in local areas, um, you still may be asked to take on some of your own uh, design with your own artistic abilities. And I believe everyone has the capacity to be creative. So playwriting, I have a picture there of Midsummer Night's Dream, our rendition at Powers Auditorium. Uh, you can see mangoes there on the far left. So our playwright writes the play, right? Uh, pretty straightforward. But we're dealing with a script like Shakespeare, your director kind of becomes part playwright um, because they help evolve the script. Um, often, if you're working with a playwright, which I've had the honor of doing before, it was very cool, uh, they come and watch rehearsal. They may then go rewrite portions of the scene and um, or whole acts or change the ending of the play. If they once they see it on their feet, they feel like it doesn't work. Uh, if I'm moving too fast, feel free to pause, write down some of the things. Remember, there is a 10 question quiz if I'm moving too fast. Uh, I tend to get a little Gilmore Girlsy and, and uh, talk too fast, but... Andrew and drag, it never gets old. Every night when he would pop those balloons, the house would go crazy. So funny. So there's David Crutcher. Oh, we miss David Crutcher. And uh, he was the director for A Midsummer Night's Dream. They are the leader. They are charged with inspiring the troops. They're also in charge of coordinating with the designers to make sure that they have a unified concept, a unified vision. So you may have a really talented costume designer, a really talented lighting designer, but if they don't communicate, if they're not on the same page about the vision for the show, you can end up with a splish splash clashing mess. So you have to, as a director, say, hey, we're heading in this direction, everybody follow me. And ultimately, the director is the one responsible. Even though we may not always see them on stage, they're often the driving force hidden behind the play. They've often picked the play. Sometimes it's the producer. Um, and so they have to have a clear vision. I have a picture of Sarah here because Sarah was sort of, the whole time she was there, my unwritten stage manager. Uh, she kept up with a lot of details. Uh, Leah, if you're listening, I think of you as one of my stage managers, just a person who helps me uh, keep everything straight and has an eye for detail. Stage managers are um, organizationally gifted. Uh, I would never be a good stage manager. 
because you really do have to have a hyper-organized mind and a mind for all the details. You can't let anything slip through the cracks. So I've included a video that I'm asking you to watch, just reinforcing that stage managers really aren't supposed to be bullies. Um, they ought to have good people skills. Uh, stage managers are often equity in, um, I think that's in one of these. Um, they're uh, in, sorry, when I say equity, I mean that they're in the union and they enforce things like 10 minute breaks and providing cots and, uh, you know, allowing sick leave and all of those things. If you're an equity actor, you know, you have to have so many nights when your understudy gets to go in. They keep track of all of that. Um, during the run of the show, they're backstage making sure that all the cues uh, happen on time. They might say, like cue one, stand by, like cue one, go. Right, and then the light uh, board operator will press the go button. So part of the reason we don't really have a stage manager is because we've had trouble with our headsets getting them to work. Um, in such a small space, I'm often at the light board. Eric Peterson is often at the sound board, and we um, have done this enough that not to be, you know, knock on wood, uh, we don't need necessarily a prompt book or prompting on the cues because I'm so familiar with the play by that time. I'm in the back of the house uh, speaking it along with you. Um, when it says that you're writing down blocking, for some of you I know, took introduction to theater and this is a review, but for those of you who didn't, by blocking we just mean movement on stage, right? Movement on stage. I wonder if subconsciously I picked the fighting picture because stage managers often handle the fights. I don't know. That's an interesting question. I love that picture. Once again, that's from A Midsummer Night's Dream, Elizabeth Thamewood and Sarah Clarno. So what do scenic personnel do? This is a picture uh, of um, Once Upon a Mattress, which was a musical we did, what, five years ago, six years ago? You can see Kurt, we miss Kurt, uh, on stage there. Kurt was our set builder, and you can see his sets are much more ornate than Little Shop of Horrors was. We have stairs and a second story and this beautiful paint job. Uh, Kurt is a true artist. Um, a scenic designer is responsible for everything the audience sees on stage that's part of the set. Right? They're also not only responsible for its appearance, but also its functionality. Right? Um, that can be easy for beginning designers to miss that it, you know, the play requires three doors. We have to work in three doors. It can't just be abstract. In the case of uh, Once Upon a Mattress, we had to have a bunch of mattresses stacked on top of each other that um, our queen could, our princess could lay on, right? So certain scripts have certain requirements. I, as a director, often have to read the scripts carefully because we are working with a legit a uh, limited budget and a limited um, technical technical possibility. So I've got to read the script and say, hey, is this something producible that we can even do based on um, the parameters of our theater and our budgets? So scenic designers uh, in theaters with lots of money don't have to think as practically, um, but they do need to think about the functionality. Um, so we have the scenic designer, who's part of the scenic personnel, but then we have scenic artists, artists right? Sometimes called painters, but you can see Marley there is painting um, the stage floor. Uh, and, you know, day workers or uh, painters often will paint with long sticks, right? Uh, and it's really phenomenal to watch them work. They don't necessarily get up with a closed paintbrush. Um, I'm not really sure. I think it just saves their back if they're working that way. Uh, Kurt is a master at painting these beautiful backdrops for us, and we treasure those at Montlake College. So kind of in line with the scenic is the props, right? Props is anything a actor carries on stage. So it could be a book, it could be a phone, it could be a pen. Um, sometimes the Scenic furniture is considered props, just depends on how big the prop crew is and how big the scenic crew is. Um, property masters often run the props, keep track of the inventory. Uh, they may design them, sculpt them, build them, paint them, buy them, depending on what kind of props you have. So the property master is over all the props. And they infamously ask you not to touch the prop if it's not your prop. Right? So, 
Uh, so there's some pictures here at Motlow of us working on lights for Madagascar. Uh, that's Tyler. If you don't have never met Tyler, he is a lovely actor and we miss him dearly at Motlow Theater. So a designer can happen from a distance, if I haven't said that already. We can have a scenic designer working from New York City. They can just send their designs in. It doesn't have to be someone on the ground. I have a friend who works at Theater Memphis and they get a lot of their designs from out of state, um, from famous designers. Uh, and it helps build the intrigue for their shows to say such and such designed it. So, um, so the lighting designer has a clear vision. And then in bigger productions, we have a master electrician who's in charge of supervising the crew and um, running the hang and focus, which is just the time when uh, the lights get how they need to be focused for our show. So for example, um, we had a hang and focus the week before all this craziness went down and we were looking at, okay, Little Shop of Horrors, all of it happens more downstage than other plays we did. Uh, Madagascar happened a lot of it upstage because um, that's where the um, kind of different levels were upstage. So the, the lights were focus back there, but we had to change it for Little Shop of Horrors. We had to focus the lights more towards the downstage because we had that whole back part um, available for the special effect of the puppet eating the people. So um, the master electrician installs, maintains, that means changing light bulbs, changing gels when they burn out, um, and hanging and focusing, running the equipment. The electricians are everybody that the master electrician is over. So you may have heard them called light board operators or spot operators. Um, you can refer to them in that like very specific title, but in general, they would just be considered electricians because they have interchangeable skills. The same person running the light board could probably also focus the light or run the light board, uh, the spot operations. So um, electricians are what we call Tyler there. Master electrician is what I would call David Crutcher. Um, and we've never hired a lighting designer. We don't have that kind of money or those sort of capabilities, honestly. But um, often I'm kind of the one up in the light booth. I kind of like it that way. Uh, I like to be able to watch the shows. And um, it's very gratifying for me to see all that pay off. And uh, I build the cue sheets and all of that because sometimes it's easier for me to do it. I'd love for us to have more time to teach you guys lighting skills. If for no other reason that... Um, this is often a, a good pay lead, uh, paying gig, you know, if you get to be a good electrician, um, you know, you can set up for concerts in Nashville, you can get daily work as an electrician, as a roadie, and um, it makes good money. It is back-breaking work, too. It's, it's not a job <laughs> always for people of all ages. If you are young and fit, uh, electrician might be a great job for you to uh, take a stab at. I say that as a person humbled by having to climb the ladder and crawl uh, up into the cats and all of that. Uh, lifting, heavy lighting instrument, that one that Tyler's got in his hands there is um, probably 25 pounds, 30 pounds. And um, you know, he has to hold it while we get all of the hardware tightened and stuff like that. So here's the place where I feel most comfortable, so I put a picture of me there, is costume personnel. I work professionally as a costume designer and a stitcher. Um, so designers are just responsible for the visual appearance of the actor. And sometimes that includes makeup, sometimes not. It just depends on the budget of the production. So I've included a video from costume designer from Black Panther, which I think does a great job of showing you renderings and kind of fabrics and how she works with the personality of the actors, which is something that I really like to do too as a designer, a costume designer, is really how can I highlight what this actor is bringing to this role rather than just basing it all off the script, which is also important to help tell the story. Um, but how does this unique actor, how, do, how does their personality, how does this costume highlight what they're bringing to the table? So the shop supervisor um, supervises all of the stitchers, the drapers, um, the um, handicraft people who may be sewing on beads or bedazzling something. Um, so the, the shop supervisor keeps track of the budget and supervises the shop. 
Stitchers operate machines and do hand sewing. Stitchers are kind of the electricians of lighting as to stitchers of costumes. Uh, they they uh, keep everything productive and, and moving, um, but they are mostly just doing what they're told. Uh, and, you know, often we'll be following a pattern, but sometimes the draper has to cut it all out and tell you how to stitch it. Uh, either way, um, stitchers are sort of the bottom of the totem pole. And uh, the most professional work I've had is as a stitcher, just, you know, doing as I'm told. Um, I'm really proud of my friends at the Alliance in Atlanta. I have some friends, professional costumers, who've been sewing masks for the coronavirus, uh, which I think is really cool. They made the news. And a lot of my friends who are costume designers are sort of out of work right now, and they're furiously making masks just as out of the goodness of their heart, even though they're unemployed, which I just uh, could not be more proud. I made a mask for my mother to wear to uh, her doctor's appointment for her breast cancer, and someone insulted it. <laughs> she said, you can't wear that makeshift mask and gave her an official hospital grade mask. And I was very insulted. Uh, so anyway, it doesn't matter. I, it's been a while since I've done a lot of, um, you know, sewing machine operations. So I didn't think it looked makeshift, but I see what she means. It's not hospital, it's hospital grade. So that's fine. I did costume design a uh, midsummer night's dream and it was so much fun to costume myself. Uh, that's always one of the hardest parts for me as an actor is wearing something someone else hands me because uh, I'm just so specific and picky about the kind of clothes that I like. And um, yeah, so there's Buffy. We miss you, Buffy. Uh, so a makeup designer creates the visuals of the makeup worn. Um, like I said, sometimes we have a costume designer slash makeup, but not for Midsummer Night's Dream. You can see these great things that Buffy uh, worked on here. These really cool ears that are bedazzled and bedazzling people's faces was really fun. In a lot of professional theaters, actors are responsible for putting on their own makeup, especially if it's just street makeup, a beauty makeup, a makeup to enhance their natural features. Um, often a makeup crew will be hired or used if you have fantasy-based makeup, which is what this would be, kind of like a, an alien or, um, you know, some weird creature. Uh, old age makeup which can often include prosthetics or latex, like we're adding a nose or um, sometimes wrinkles will be applied in prosthetics. And then special effects characters, you know, if we're doing a slasher film or there's blood on stage, uh, we'll hire um, often a special effects makeup artist. They kind of specialize in uh, this or that. Um, times when I've had makeup crew, I was in our town and I had big, Pentecostal hair almost I say that in love I have lots of friends who are Pentecostal and uh, no hate but you know that that sort of Gilmore uh, not Gilmore girls uh, but big hair you know big um, uh, turn of the century hair and I, I got a costume I got a makeup artist then um, it's another time I've had a makeup artist when I did a check off play once again turn of the century so if it's a period um, makeup or hair uh, then often you'll have a makeup crew assigned to you. But uh, most actors are expected to be able to do their makeup. And sometimes the different venues require different kinds of makeup. So when I did outdoor drama, for example, we had to over-articulate our contour lines because it was thousands of people in the house. So you had to sort of create um, large contour lines. So if you're doing a more intimate show, like our house only has 250 seats, so you don't have to glob on the makeup the way that you might for a big, huge venue. Sound. So this is Crybaby the Musical. Uh, you can see um, Edwin. I don't know if you know any of these people, but this down here is our orchestra. We would have had an orchestra for Little Shop of Horrors. Uh, in the same place, even. Um, I am taking this from the light booth. I hope that's not too confusing. The sound booth, as you know, is on the floor uh, of the house where most of the patrons sit. But the sound designer um, is can be a lot of different things depending on the show. So if I'm doing a classical piece, like a Shakespeare, I may need to find music that nobody owns, right, that has royalty-free music to play between scenes. 
and that could be my job as the sound designer is to pick the pre-show music, to pick the transition music. And that's one sort of sound designer gig. Um, if I'm doing a musical and I need um, specific sound effects created, kind of like a Foley artist, that could be a different kind of sound designer gig. The sound designer is relatively one of the newer positions in the theater. As we've come up with more um, ways to amplify sound. It's only in the last couple hundred years that sound designing has even become a thing, um, but they are integral to the enjoyment of a play. Um, you can see Edwin there is fooling with his um, wireless mic. Just running the wireless mics is a job in and of itself. So what Eric Peterson does for us is sound engineering, and that's not to be confused with what they do in um, recording booths, um, but it is kind of some of the same skills, making sure that the sound mixes well, that it's cohesive, it sounds aesthetically pleasing to everybody, um, mixing the live voices with the musical instruments, you know, and making sure that uh, it makes a nice mix for people to hear in the house. The soundboard operator, well, I say Eric is sound engineering. He's engineering and he's operating um, because we're a small operation. So like I said, running the body mics, you guys who are on the sound crew are in charge of keeping those um, batteries in there. Um, as soundboard operator, they have to take the cues and they have to have good timing playing sound effects at the right time to make sure that it's believable. There's nothing worse than an actor waiting for a phone to ring on stage and the phone doesn't ring and the whole audience is, you know, kind of just waiting with dead air. So sound personnel keeps everything flowing, creates a good mix for everybody through the reinforcement equipment we have. So um, I just, these are just the ones that I had on the syllabus. I wanted to go over just a few other jobs that are, um, we haven't talked about. They're not necessarily, um, something that was required by our syllabus to teach, but I feel bad saying there are these careers in theater. I don't want you to think those are the only careers. Um, so vocal co coaches are sometimes called dialect coaches. If you're good at doing impressions of people, if you're good at mimicking dialects, this could be a really cool job for you. Marketing, especially online marketing, is a whole new avenue for theaters to pursue. Ticketing, taking tickets, um, but also running the ticketing software um, and uh, taking reservations, answering the phones, house manager. That's the person who's over managing the ushers and making sure that everybody is comfortable in the house, um, right? Which you remember is this place out here where the audience sits. During the show, they're also responsible for running the house. Intimacy directors. This is a fairly new position. These are people who work in um, possible sex scenes or when there's intimacy demanded on stage, and they help everyone feel comfortable and help the director uh, to be sensitive in those situations to creating intimate moments and um, just simple things like making sure that it's warm enough if a, an actor is scantily clad. So choreographers, uh, big shout out to Connie, couldn't do these musicals without her. Don't know what we're going to do next year when she moves to Murfreesboro. Um, I have choreographed, I've loved dance, I've danced my whole life, um, but it is a lot of um, work and uh, on top of my other director duties it can be really hard for me to also choreograph. I did that for uh, Once Upon a Mattress and told myself maybe shouldn't do this again because it's just a lot to keep track of. Um, fight coaches or actor combatants. Uh, this is another thing that I've done. Um, once again just making sure the safety of the actors through the fight sequences. Often they'll choreograph the fights and take that off of the director's plate as well. Um, some shows require uh, fight coaches, some, a show that's fight heavy like Macbeth. Other shows just have an actor combatant, an actor in the cast who's sort of um, the lead in keeping safe uh, the actors and they do fight call before the show to make sure that everybody's safe during the fights. Pyrotechnics! If you like to watch things explode then this is a good job for you. Um, working in outdoor theater pyrotechnics was a big job because we had um, explosives and cannons going off on stage. Some Places like Disneyland have um, fireworks every night, so pyrotechnicians, uh, a lot of concerts now have fire uh, included in their um, concerts just to add an element of surprise and excitement and danger. So if you like blowing stuff up, there's a job in theater for you.
projectionists. This is a really new exciting job, um, just designing projections that go on in play. Some theaters are deleting all of their sets and just going with projections. Uh, they kind of make me dizzy. <laughs> I get a little bit, uh, you know, I don't like riding roller coasters or anything. If the, if the projections move and things like that, um, it can be a little disorienting for me. Those of you who went to Dear Evan Hansen got to see a great example of projections used well. Uh, I think that's really cool. Um, I've been in to productions where I thought the projections sort of cheapened it. Um, for example, Miss Saigon, which is Andrew Lloyd Webber play. Famously, there's this big helicopter that comes in at the end, and instead of doing that big special effect, they just did a projection of it, and I was really disappointed. So, um, But if you're good with technology and graphic design, projectionist might be a new exciting role in the theater for you. All right, well, here are some careers in theater. Um, also could be shot... Uh, titled different committees that you're working on and that you were assigned to do. I hope that helps clarify some of the um, work that is available and I hope that you are taking good care of yourself during this time of quarantine um, and if you are interested in these kind of um, jobs then you may want to look at four-year schools that teach it, right? So if one of the reasons I chose the master's degree program I did is because they had a good co combat um, program that certified me in multiple weapons. And I knew that that was something that I really enjoyed and that I found a lot of um, specialized skill out of. So if you know that that's kind of the direction you want to go in your theater career, you may want to be interested in taking a class just in that. For those of you who are going to major in theater at MTSU, your third and fourth year, you can take a class just in voice and diction. You can take a class just in um, choreographing for musical theater. So be thinking now about what elements of theater you want to specialize in. But I want to challenge you if you want to come back to Tennessee to be a generalist, to try your hand at everything. Try it. You'll like it. A lot of you are creative, competent people that I have no doubt. Uh, sometimes when I'm sitting down to create committees, I'm like, should I put her, you know, should I put mangoes on prop committee or paint committee? Because she can do both. Uh, so just looking at your skills and talents, figure out what works for you, what doesn't, what you're willing to do and what you're not. And uh, chase your passions. I hope you're finding time in this stressful environment to create art, to doodle, to color, to paint, to do things that are meaningful um, artistically as that don't want to let those skills run dry. All right, as always, thank you for listening.